Welcome to Measuring Success Right, the official podcast of the Marriott Student Review, a podcast for students by students, where we connect the leaders of tomorrow with the issues of today. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Um, my name is Jason. And Hunter. And we are super lucky to have Professor Sherry Thomas with us today. Thanks Thank for joining you. us. Thank you for having me. Well, before we really dive into it, um, we'd love to hear a little bit about you. All right. Well, I am a graduate of BYU myself from the School of Accountancy with my master's in information systems consulting. And I was still single when I graduated. So I went to San Francisco and worked for Pricewaterhouse. And I was there for about four years before leaving public accounting to go to industry. I uh, did a a control. I was as a controller for WordPerfect Corporation, which I don't know if a lot of people even know what that company <laughs> is anymore. But uh, and then they were acquired by Novell, and I continued to work for them when I moved. I was married at the. I got married, and then I my husband went to law school and was doing a clerkship and moving around a bit. So I kept telling him, I think I need to quit now because I'm moving to here or there. And they're like, Oh, just work from home. So I worked from home for six years uh, with Novell till um, I started having a little hard time juggling three kids and work. So I thought, okay, I got to take a break. But um, my break was only short lived only had a couple of years before my husband lost his job. And a few days after that, uh, a coworker at mine of Novell called me up and said, I've been trying to find you. Uh, I was looking at, you know, BYU alumni, would you come back to Utah if I moved your family back to be our controller. They were trying to implement Oracle, and that was a lot of my experience was implementing systems, ERP systems, project managing those implementations. And uh, so I came back, and we implemented Oracle and got that live. And then from there, I just job hunted a, a job switched jobs a couple times, you know, that company sold. And then I went to go work for a small startup company in Salt Lake that uh, builds medical devices to prevent stroke. And they asked me to be their CFO. So I was their CFO for about nine years. And then Johnson & Johnson acquired us. And and at the time I was their CFO, I was an adjunct professor here. And I was an adjunct for about 10 years. And a full-time position opened up last year. So I am now starting my second year as a full-time professor and, and loving it. And I have four kids, and their ages are 30 to 21. They're all grown now. <laughs> and I, um, I'm a single mom. I've been a single mom since my youngest was six years old. So, you know, I've been really lucky to have the greatest kids ever. And so it's been fun to, to have them in my life. Well, thanks. Yeah. I, we appreciate that. Sure. Well, just a follow up, follow-up question for you. Um, you, te- you helped implement Oracle and ERP systems at work. Sounds like just in our conversations prior that that's what you kind of are doing right now here in, at the business school. Exactly, exactly. And how that got started was as a CFO for this uh, medical device company, I would hire some of my own students that were in my classes and I'd hand pick my favorites and I'd say, hey, come work for me, be my intern for a year. It was all remote work. It was work that they just did from home or school and uh, we would do things like teach them how to analyze different reports and information that flow through the system. And I started to realize when I give them some of the more sexy things to do, like, you know, <laughs> look at a look at a budget to actual variance and try to dig down and find out what's making that up. Give me some proposals for changes. They really didn't know how to navigate in the system. They didn't know where to go, how to start, where how to find information from the front end of these systems where everything was integrated. So I kept thinking, you know, we need to teach our students ERP systems. And I asked my interns, too. I said, if, if you could learn or take one class um, at BYU that would help you be, you know, more confident as an intern for working for me, what would it be? And they go, well, I need to learn ERPs. I don't, I didn't get, I didn't understand what they did. I didn't know how they integrated. You know, they just didn't understand the whole flow and process of that data. So I said, that's a good idea. So when I came on full time last year, I, I approached uh, the the administration for the School of Accounts, and I said, you know, we really do need an ERP class. And they said, okay, well, will you teach it? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Wait, just quickly, remind me what ERP stands oh, for. Enterprise Resource Planning. Okay. Yeah, cool. so it's it it's for systems that are like QuickBooks and NetSuite and Oracle, SAP. Those are all systems that companies use to keep their books, to process data and to run reports, to do all kinds of analysis and projections. And uh, so I had to spend the summer this past summer creating a class, an ERP class that started this fall. And uh, we did start with QuickBooks just so that they had an idea of what small companies are using. And at first, there was a little bit of, 
you know, hesitation, like, do we really want to teach them QuickBooks? <clears throat> it seemed like that was a system that was just kind of too small for us. And maybe it was going to be widely um, utilized by the students in their careers. But I found out through our executive advisory committee that that was something they felt was very worthwhile when they were approached and told that this is what we were doing. Mm-hmm. Um, I know that a friend of mine just got approached by UVU to be their adjunct professor to teach QuickBooks, so just a whole class on QuickBooks. You know, University of Hawaii teaches it, University of Idaho. I mean, there's everybody's going that direction. And so I'm grateful that I got a chance to um, to present that to the students. But I'm not spending a whole semester on that. We're just starting with that, which is what small companies use, startup companies. And then I'm teaching them what mid-sized companies use, which is NetSuite. We just started that in, in the curriculum this week. And then we'll move on to SAP. But the SAP version I'm showing and presenting to them is a, is a gaming system called ERP Sim, where they have to go into the system. They have to decide as a group how I'm going to spend my marketing dollars to promote my products, where do I where do I put my products, how do I manage my vendors and suppliers, and they, they're more high-level decisions, not like the lower-level data entry that maybe they were doing in through these other systems to get familiar with how data flows. And then we will present a leaderboard, and the group that's at the top with the most revenue or most sales will win that leaderboard board position and then we'll reset it and go again and see if anybody else can now you know change you can change your strategy and then go again and see so I think it'll be really useful for them to see how these decisions impact what they're doing and and the you know how the company performs and uh, then I have them just do a project a project at the end where they create a challenge in Tech Hub which is something that's been developed by the School of Accountancy to give anybody anybody can access this to do a challenge develop with software different kinds of software uh, could be Alteryx, it could be Power BI, and so we're hoping to now put an ERP challenge in there that mm-hmm. students can play with to get more familiar with these systems. And uh, we're loving, we're having such a good time. It's very chill, We it's very interactive, it's very hands-on. You know, I maybe have one or two slides at most that I talk about at the beginning of class, and from there it's just us interacting and working in the systems. And wow. Yeah, I only have 11 students right now, so anybody out there listening, I would love to have more students next fall, so keep that in mind. <laughs> and, and someone that's had in- industry experience, What's your answer if I ask you how many percentage of students might see this in the business world? Like, oh, in some capacity or another, 100%. 100%. 100%. They might not be users in the system, but they may be auditing a company that has a system, and they need to be able to be familiar with what kinds of reports come out of the system so that they know what to ask for, so they know what the options are for gathering data that they need to use to complete the audit. Tax may need reports that they also need to run for whatever they do. I'm not a tax person, so whatever they do. Um, But uh, then there's consulting. There's a lot of students interested in consulting, and they may bump into this. So, for example, when we got acquired by Johnson & Johnson, they kept me on for about five years to help integrate our company. And then when they discovered my project management skills and my ability with systems, they actually started using me to help project manage acquisitions. So we would go out and acquire these small companies, California, Texas, and we needed to integrate them into Johnson Johnson Systems Mm -hmm. and help them become part of the company. And so each one of those, a lot of them are just pretty small, and so almost all of them were on QuickBooks. So I had to learn QuickBooks myself to be able to know how to move them from there to where we needed them to be or keep them on their legacy system, which is QuickBooks, for a period of time. And then we had to manage that to make sure it was operating with our controls, those kinds of things. So in almost any capacity, you will bump into it one way or another. And it's it's good to at least be familiar with it and what it does, even if you don't you know, use it or interface with it. Yeah. Yeah. Wow, it sounds like you're doing some really fascinating stuff here at BYU. And I would say yeah. people who aren't in the accounting world all of that probably just went straight over the head, just yeah. like me, because I'm not Sorry. accounting, but Jason is. Um, so I kind of wanted to ask a few questions based off your bio that you kind of went over. Okay. One thing I wanted to ask was you kind of talked about how you got your undergrad here at BYU, then got your master's, and then went off to work. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of people here at BYU, and I felt, I've felt i definitely felt this, I wonder if Jason has as well, that people feel like they need to get married super quick here at BYU and focus on that rather than their careers because they're here in, you know, the BYU world and that's where all the people are. Yeah. What would you say to people that are feeling stressed on how to balance, you know, the search for, you know, a spouse and following their dreams in accounting like you? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think now after having 34 years in industry and after all my 
life's experiences. You know, I talked about being a single mom. I think it boils down to, at least from my opinion, it boils down to trusting Heavenly Father. Mm -hmm. You know, I was one of those who didn't think I would ever have a career. I just thought accounting was fun. I know that sounds nerdy, (laughs) um, but I just thought this totally fits my personality. This will be great. And then um, when I found myself single and going out to work, I thought, wait, what? Wait a minute. I remember walking down the streets of San Francisco where I started and carrying a briefcase, wearing a suit, and thinking, what in the world am I doing here? You know, how did I get here? Yeah. And uh, but as I progressed through my life and as I started to see things unfold, so I happened to be married to someone who had some mental health issues, mm-hmm. and he ended up just leaving our family one day, just didn't come home. And so I was very fortunate that I had an education to support my family in a very comfortable way. I could send them to school, send them on missions, you know, give them opportunities to learn sports or dance or whatever. And uh, so I can see now the wisdom in Heavenly Father's hand and making sure I had that education behind me, making sure I had the opportunity to do those things. Now, that's not to say that women or anybody shouldn't pursue a career if that's really what they desire because there's a lot of us with skills blessed with skills and abilities that and talents that are needed out there in the workforce and I totally encourage that and I did find a lot of joy in my career I think it was something's perfect for me that I found very fulfilling and you know when I wasn't being a mom I found something to do that was very rewarding um, so I think, you know, you've got to trust Heavenly Father's timing and know that he's got your back and know that he's mindful of you and that things will work out the way they're supposed to. And you don't always know the reason for the path you're following until years later. You can look mm-hmm. back and say, OK, I get why that played out the way it did. Mm-hmm. So that would just be my answer. Yeah, yeah. that's super helpful because oh, I think thanks. a lot of people are in that struggle between how to balance that. And I think that was a great, great answer to that oh, thanks. question that I had that's kind of a fun one is, It sounds like you're so passionate about accounting and what you do. And I feel like a lot of people, especially me too, sometimes we have a career path that we enjoy, but it's hard to be super passionate Mm -hmm. within it. Mm -hmm. How did you develop that passion for accounting and what can others do to further their passion in the career path they're on? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I think it's a matter of leaving your mind open and not expect to go down a very specific path. So I have students come into my office and sometimes they're really worried because they don't have their five-year plan together. I'm like, okay, well, let's throw the five-year plan out the window because I'm telling you, (laughs) it's not going to probably go as you expect and it'll even be better than what you expect. Mm -hmm. So I tell them, you know, there's going to be doors open and opportunities that you didn't even think of that will be something that's very, very fulfilling and very exciting for you. So whenever I get asked you know, whenever I tell people that I'm an accountant, they'll say, oh, you must really like math. And I'm like, you know, I don't even own a calculator. <laughs> <And> so <laughs> for me, it's, you know, where I have found my uh, passion in this field is where I can apply my project management skills, where I can apply my logic skills, where I can interact with people. So there's opportunities in every aspect of your personality that you can find if, you know, you just got to Got to get how to get out there, get some experience to know what fits for you. Get out there and see what you like and don't like. And until you get out there, you don't always know, you know. And I didn't know if you'd have told me this would have been my path with systems and project management, I'd have been like, oh, I didn't see that one coming, you know, because I just thought that I'd go out and follow the traditional accounting career mm-hmm. role with manager, controller, and CFO. But a lot of my experience has been project management, and I found that I have a, a real knack for that and ability for that, and that's been because of that I found a lot of joy and passion for it Mm -hmm. and so I think that that's if you know if people can just keep their mind open and know that as they get out there they'll see opportunity they'll explore doors will open and they will they'll be able to figure that out Mm -hmm. as they go perfect I think that's great I kind of one thing I like that you said was you know a lot of people have that stereotype of accounting math numbers and you're like you don't have to be that there's so much to do within the sphere of accounting and you found your passion within it yeah Others can do the same as well. Oh, absolutely, mm-hmm. for sure. Yeah. yeah, I think every profession has their stereotype, and I think people think it's <laughs> going to be one type, you know, this is all I'm going to do. Yeah. But they'll find that there are varied career paths and roles you can have in every every education that you find here at BYU. There'll be uh, lots of variability and lots of opportunity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And something I love, too, is that you've been able to do all that and be a mom, you know? Yes. That's really, that seems like it's been very flexible for you in 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 this career path you've taken? It has. It really has. I've been very fortunate that with the positions I've had, I can do some from remotely from home. Um, they've been really flexible with me knowing that I'm a single mom and saying, you know what, you know, I 
take a Friday off, go go do some admin activities that you need to get done. Um, but they are just very supportive of that. There have been times when I've wished I could be home more. There have been times, you know, you, there is some trade-off. There are some sacrifices that you make. But you do what you have to do. And my kids, as a result of that, have been become very independent. They, you know, I, I was never home in time to help them with their homework. They got it done on their mm-hmm. on their own. They, you know, they really excelled and were successful. Um, so sometimes what we think might be a disadvantage in our lives can become a really real advantage in different ways. There can be blessings out of every situation that we're in. Yeah, Yeah. I love that. Another question I had that was related to something that happened quite a lot, it seems like, in your career was companies acquiring other companies. And I think that that's kind of a scary thing sometimes in the profession because I think a lot of people think, oh, is there going to be layoffs? Are people going to take my job? In your experience, what are the pros and cons of being acquired or acquiring other companies, and how can professionals kind of navigate that process? Yeah, you know, actually, I haven't seen that where they've laid a lot of people off. Mm-hmm. If anybody gets laid off, it's what we call the C-suite people. It's the CEOs, the COOs. The C- so I totally, as a CFO, expected to get laid off. But they saw that with my system skills that they needed me to help them integrate and help them with my institutional knowledge of the company, transfer knowledge. And then as that started to progress, they saw opportunities for me in other areas where they needed my role, you know, managing these acquisitions. Um, I think, honestly, most of the small company acquisitions that we've acquired and even we ourselves had the same approach, we were looking for an exit. We were actually looking to sell the company because it could be very profitable. If everybody in the company has stock options, which automatically vest when you're acquired, mm-hmm. or you know the stock in themselves, it can be pretty profitable to take that portion of that ownership and your purchase price of the company is divided up by those stockholders. And so everybody in our company, from the front desk person to the clean room operator, building our device, everybody had stock options and stock. So everybody got a pretty good payout. And so that was exciting for them to have totally. that, yeah, that kind of payout. And they kept everybody on. Mm-hmm. The, the only thing that I think that would probably be a disadvantage is that it does change culture. So we were a small family-oriented company, and then a big company comes in, and they bring in their big company culture. <laughs> and, you know, it didn't sit well with some people. And so some people left it voluntarily. Mm-hmm. You know, they found other opportunities with other small companies or the next opportunity that they thought would be a better fit for them. So um, it just was a really positive experience all the way around, I think. Yeah. That is really great. Well, we want to ask you a couple questions about the Marriott School of Values. Okay. Um, so just for reference, they're faith in Christ, integrity in action, respect for all, and excellence. Yeah. So my question is, do any of these stand out to you more than, like, does one stand out to you more than the others, and, and why? Yeah, that's a good question. Probably a couple. I'll speak to faith in Christ because that, to me, has been very critical in my life personally, as I explained, being a single mom and you know, when um, I first became a single mom, I didn't have a job. And fortunately, I had a CPA license, and the economy had completely crashed. It was 2008 when everything, nobody was hiring. But there were opportunities for anybody who had a CPA license. And so I was actually given two offers to choose from. And so it, it worked out well, and I can see Heavenly Father's hand in all of that. So I know as we as we establish our faith in Christ, and I think I've already touched on it, that he will direct our paths, he will guide us. And I think we get too worried about our own decisions and how they how they propel us forward. But if we trust him and know that he's gonna guide it, we just have to start start our foot one, for, one after another, just start walking, just start going, take, take an opportunity, trust in him that he's gonna guide you down that path. Um, then the integrity for all, I would say that I've, as I've gone through my career, um, the integrity question is... As an audit professor. As an audit professor, yeah. <laughs> oh, as an audit professor, oh. Okay, well, um, uh, well, I would say, you know, and I do teach my students this quite a bit, and you've probably heard me say this in class since you've had me as a professor, but I do teach a lot. There's, it. what goes around comes around, or karma, or, you know, whatever you call it, reap what you sow. Time and time again, even as a professor and even in my professional career, I've seen that those who uh, operate and, and walk with integrity, they'll be rewarded. It may not be immediate, but they'll get rewarded. And I've seen the opposite. I've seen very high-performing professionals 
take shortcuts and, you know, compromise their integrity, and they've been caught and they've been fired immediately. And so, you know, I, it, it doesn't pay to try to take shortcuts or try to jeopardize your integrity for a little bit of advancement or a little bit of promotion. It will come around, and it may take time, but it, will, it always comes around. So that's, that's a concept I always teach pretty thoroughly in my classes to be true to who you are and, be, and you know, be true to your integrity. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's great. One other thing that we always love to ask is um, the vision of the Marriott School of Business is we aspire to transform the world through Christ-like leadership. Mm -hmm. Um, How have you implemented this idea in your life and what are some of the fruits of it? Uh, That's a great question. I would say when I think of Christ as a leadership, I automatically think of the love he has for his disciples and for those who are not even kind to him. He loves unconditionally and genuinely. And I think how kind he is and, and how how confident he is to speak truth, and he doesn't hold back. And so I look at that example, and I think if I look at my role as a professor, my favorite thing is to love the students. And so I left my CFO position for a pretty significant pay cut to um, come be a full-time professor for that very reason, because I wanted to be with the students. I wanted an opportunity to love them, to influence them, to hopefully guide them. And uh, when I'm in the classroom, I always come out of the classroom just feeling so much joy and so much love for them. And I hope that if there's one thing I've been able to do, those who've come to my office, you know, feeling depressed or feeling discouraged or having some pretty serious crises in their lives and confided in me, I hope I'm able to give them some hope. That's been something I've really valued about my, my role as a professor is to be able to help them and help the students feel hopeful and to know that, you know, it's never too late to change a path or to, you know, start again or re- get back up on your feet and keep going. Just don't give up, you know. And uh, so loving them in that way and uh, seeing their success as they go on and thrive, not just in the community and their professions, but thrive in their families and, you know, become very successful in all areas of their life has been very rewarding to see them move on in that capacity. Perfect. That's amazing. And kind of tying in with that answer and question, the mission of the Marriott School is to develop leaders. Um, And kind of like you talked about with, um, you know, Christ-like leadership, what are some of the attributes of these leaders? What, what do they look like and how can we become them? Oh, good question. I would say that the, the best leaders I've seen and best managers that I've had are those who are very secure with who they are, who know who they are, who are confident about themselves. And so developing those traits is very, very important. Um, otherwise, it can be a little bit challenging working for people or with people like that because then it becomes more of a competition between me and my employees. There can be control issues. It can be, you know, the insecurity really wreaks havoc in those types of relationships between, you know, manager and and employee. But, um, yeah, I would say that would be one. I would say go out and be kind, that there's no need to be, you know, a dominant personality and be unkind to people. That is something that I find that people who are kind and fair and all that they do draw people to them. They draw opportunities to them because those are the people that everyone wants to work with and work for. You'll be given opportunities if you are the kind of person that is a team player and that is a positive person that has a good attitude towards, you know, the task at hand, even when things are going wrong, who's, you know, optimistic that things are going to work out, who encourages others to be their best who builds others up, who recognizes success and achievement in others and makes sure they call that out and recognizes and rewards them for that. Those, to me, I've seen as being the most uh, important traits that I've seen in very successful leaders. Amazing. I love that. Anything else you want to add, Jason? Yeah. um, Our podcast is called Measuring Success Right, so it would only be fitting to ask you how you measure success. Uh, That's a good question. You know, when my son came home from his mission, and he had a really difficult mission, I don't know if he even baptized anybody, maybe one person, and he felt really discouraged about that. And when he had his closing interview with the stake president, when he came home, or welcome home interview, the stake president said, you know what, what really measures success is walking out the door every day. It's not the numbers. And I would measure success the same way. I would say it's just not giving up. It's staying in the game. It's being what we call in the arena, one of my favorite um speakers is Brene Brown, and she talks about being in the arena and getting bloody and failing and then rising above your failures and trying and trying again. To me, that success is just is 
sorry, just staying in the arena so that you can influence others and that you can succeed even amidst the failures and the setbacks. It doesn't, it's not measured by a title or measured by a salary. It's measured by your growth and the influence and the impact you have on others and the way you can serve and help and bless other people's lives. It's measured by just just keep going, just keep keep walking out that door and just keep trying. Amazing, I love that, thank, <laughs> thank you so you. much. Oh, thank you so much. Um, just to add to, um, I feel like a lot of our listeners would love to get some advice or other you know, help from you, if you'd be willing, is there a way that somebody could reach out to you if you have any questions relating oh. to accounting or just corporate life or leadership woman questions? Absolutely. I would love to get involved with that. I'm trying as much as I can to be involved with other campus groups, you know, the, the SOA, Women's Association. Mm-hmm. I mean, anyway, I would love to be of service to anybody that could benefit from my experience or for, you know, if I can help in any way. So my email is uh, S Tom, let's see, it was Sherry, S-H-E-R-I underscore Thomas. Mm-hmm. Um, at byu.edu and I'll even give you my cell phone if that's okay it's 801-318-2705 that's how I'm contacted by phone here on campus so please reach out I'd be happy to contribute in any way I can perfect thank you so much any last words of advice or things you want to put for the listeners before we end oh I would just say enjoy the journey you know this is a short life and you know it seems long at times it seems like oh my goodness I'm never going to get through this <laughs> but um, just just be positive enjoy each day look for the positive stay positive love those around you um, you know when it's all said and done and you look back you know you look at the things that are going to matter most and it's your relationships it's the people that you've able to influence it's the memories that you make and you know where your treasure is there where your heart be also and you know I can't help but quote President Nelson when he says think celestial think celestial because those what matters most is what going to have is going to have that celestial impact and I've seen that now as an old woman and looking back on a long career that I've learned that way that those are the things that really matter and focus on those Awesome. Love that. Thank you so much. Thank sure. you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry, I'm kind of speechless. I'm, thank you so much for no, coming. No. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for having me. You. No, I appreciate being here. Make sure you subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Play, or SoundCloud so you never miss an episode. Be a friend and tell a friend about measuring success right. This podcast is a project of the Marriott Student Review at Brigham Young University. You can find us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Marriott Student Review or online at MarriottStudentReview.org. The views and opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect official policy or position of Brigham Young University or The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints.